from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Face the State on the Montana Television Network. I'm Mike Dennison, MTN's chief political reporter. Today we're going to talk politics, but not the politics of the present. However, the subject of our show had a profound impact on Montana's political landscape, impacts that continue to this day. This year is the 50th anniversary of the election of Democrat Forrest Anderson as Montana's 17th governor. Mr. Anderson served only one term from 1969 through 1972, but it's often said that he's the governor who dragged Montana's state government into the modern age in more ways than one. He pushed through a massive reorganization of state government, converting it from 170 boards and commissions to just 19 departments, answerable to the governor. He created the State Board of Investments, which has since earned more than $2 billion for the citizens of Montana. He was instrumental in the passage of Montana's 1972 Constitution and is the only person to serve not only as governor, but also as a legislator, attorney general, and justice on the Montana Supreme Court. To talk today about Mr. Anderson and his, and his legacy, we have three guests. Alec Hansen from, from Missoula, a speechwriter and special assistant to Mr. Anderson. Forrest Anderson's son, Newell Anderson, who's been an assistant to two Montana governors and is a former division administrator in Montana's Department of Commerce. And Bob Hankel, who is Helena Ad Agency, ran the ad campaign for Anderson's gubernatorial campaign. Bob is now the manager of Helena's Old Glory flag. Before we start talking to all three of these gentlemen, we're gonna show you a clip from Anderson's first campaign in the primary election. Let's run that first clip now. I'm for Forrest Anderson. He's always been with us. He's a Democrat who will win in November. I'm voting for Forrest Anderson. I think he can make our tax dollars go further. I want my son to enjoy the great fishing and hunting I've had. Forrest Anderson's my man. My business can't grow unless Montana grows. I'm voting for Forrest Anderson. I'm Forrest Anderson. I pledge my efforts to bring all Montanans to work together to solve the serious problems which face our state. If you will vote for me on June the 4th, we can get Montana moving again. Vote Forrest Anderson, Democrat for governor. So Bob, let's first go to you and talk about that primary campaign a little bit. Of course, he was running against a state senator, uh, Mr. Mahoney, and uh, I guess Democrats felt that Babcock, Tim Babcock, the Republican governor, was vulnerable, but Anderson knew he had to get through the primary first. Who was supporting him in the primary, and why did he think that was going to be a tough campaign? Well, you know, <clears throat> first off, uh, Gene Mahoney had a lot going for him as far as the Democratic Party is concerned. Uh, the Labor Party really admired the fact that in 1967, uh, he really defeated the sales tax in the, in the legislature. He was the uh, Senate uh, majority leader. And uh, he wasn't really, uh, Gene really wasn't well known in the eastern Montana, but, but Forrest was. Twelve different elections that he had been involved with. That's right. And, and uh, during that period of time, and he was a real cunning politician. He knew how to raise money, and uh, he uh, talked about his ability based on the fact that he had served in uh, 12 years of state offices, and uh, uh, he was a candidate who could win in November. That's and, and Mahoney, of course, uh, I'm assuming he had, the, he had the support of a lot of organized labor um, yes. in the primary, which he is did. a formidable yeah. presence. and. Um, also, Newell, I was wondering about um, earlier in that primary election, we talked about a lot of the things your father did when he became governor. Do you think that he envisioned those, those sorts of things when he started running a reorganization, the Board of Investments, the Constitution, or is it something that maybe just kind of um, events just kind of came upon, a, upon him as he became governor? Mike, I think the, the kind of the secret to ex his success was he, he was a uh, worker by experience. I mean, he, he moved forward based on what he knew from the past and what he anticipated in the future. And yes, he did have uh, the Board of Investments, the reorganization, the modernization of state government very much in mind. And I think they're threaded through all of the campaign rhetoric that went on during both the primary and the general, as well as what he did when he became governor. The pay more what for wasn't about the fact that the state was broke and we didn't need any more money, it was about 
if, if you're going to pay more money, what are you going to have? You're going to have to have a, a government that's respectable and that's that's appreciated by the by the voters. And we'll talk more about those some of those things you mentioned later in the show. And also in the primary, he beat Mr. Mahoney by it was fairly close. It's 38 to 35 percent in the yeah, in the primary. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's show our second clip. Uh, this is a this is an ad from the general election of 1968 when uh, Forrest Anderson was running against Governor Tim Babcock, the Republican. In our state's 79-year history, only one man has ever been elected by its citizens to hold high public office in all three branches of government. You are looking at that man now. He is Forrest H. Anderson, Montana's Attorney General. After serving in the State House of Representatives and on the State Supreme Court, Forrest Anderson feels qualified to govern Montana. He has been an outstanding three-term Attorney General. This dedication to duty has won him 13 election victories. Anderson can do something about Montana's below average per capita income, its declining labor force, its 47th standing among 50 states in economic growth. Stop this downward plunge of Montana's fortunes. Elect Forrest Anderson, governor in November. Now, Alec, let's go to you with this question. At the end of that clip, we saw the, uh, the famous um, logo and, and saying, pay more what for. Um, tell us a little bit about what that meant and, and why that was um, such an effective slogan and, and such a memorable thing um, for Forrest Anderson. Well, I think, you know, at that time, the Democratic Party was solidly aligned against the sales tax. And the reason was that uh, the people that wanted a sales tax wanted to get rid of the property tax. Right or the metal mines tax or something like that. It was essentially the corporate interests in Montana that were most interested in getting rid of uh, the, these other taxes and replacing it with a sales tax. So essentially what you're doing is you're transferring the tax burden from the value of production or the value of property to the consumer. And uh, Forrest didn't believe that the people of Montana paying three cents or two cents on everything that they bought at the grocery store should have to pick up the, the burden for the, you know, the corporate interests in this state. So pay more, that was what you'd pay at the grocery store, and what for, what are you going to get? And, and the question, you know, that's a good question. At that particular time, I think the answer was nothing. Yeah. So that, you know, that was a damn persuasive slogan. You know, it rhymes, it's, it's great, and you can say it in one word. It, they drove it home and people understood what it meant. I think that was a big factor in the election. Now, Bob, in, yeah, in, in the general election, um, am I correct in thinking that, that um, Mr. Anderson felt that if he got to the Democratic primary that he could beat Babcock fairly easily? Was that, was exactly that what he thought? Right. The way he said it in the primary, he said, this is going to be a tough fight uh, against Gene Mahoney with the labor behind him. But he said, once I get that, it's going to be a cakewalk as far as beating uh, Tim Babcock, because he had this 3% sales tax lined up uh, for the state of Montana. So the, the election campaign in the fall was for or against the sales tax, and pay more what for lent right into that. Now, I, I'm struck by a couple of things. I mean, wh wh one is the, how the campaign themes of yesteryear um, almost seem like a mirror image of today's campaigns. Uh, you know, young people uh, not having an economic opportunity, uh, below average capital income, uh, uh, per capita income, you know, outdoor recreation. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, why was that something that was fresh in the mind of your dad at that time, and here it is, you know, 50 years later, and it's still people, still people talk about it. So well, I think the statistics would suggest that it hasn't changed. It doesn't change a lot. I mean, Montana is not a major industrial site in, America, in the United States. And uh, job opportunities, particularly in the high-tech industry, are located in other parts of the country. So there's always this aspiration that we want to get to be like, sort of like them, but not quite, because we still like the quality of life we have here, but we want job opportunities for our kids. And now also, Bob, one thing I want to ask you about was um, the campaign emphasized his experience in politics. It talked about being AG, Attorney General, being a legislator, being a Supreme Court justice, now that's almost seen as a drawback by some. Well, why was that right. seen then as something that was a positive? Well, it was ability, uh, certainly, and the fact that uh, in his advertising he talked about uh, 
a, a do-nothing administration for the last four years. And he felt leadership is what Montana really was looking for. Hmm. I want to go back to you, Alec, and talk a little bit about the sales tax again. Um, now, Babcock had proposed a sales tax when he was running for, for governor in 68. Um, and of course, Anderson defeated him. So how did the sales tax get from losing, essentially, in that race to getting on the ballot in 1971? How, and did Anderson get, let it get on there so it could be defeated, or how did that work? Well, there's some inside baseball involved in all of this that I don't have time to go into today. But <laughs> anyway, uh, in those days, the legislature lasted 60 days. And so they went 60 days, and they were just hopelessly deadlocked on the question of a sales tax. And there were 49 Democrats in the House and 50 Republicans. But Big Ed Smith from Medicine Lake voted with the Democrats. So they were tied 50-50, locked up just like that. You couldn't get out of it. And uh, so they'd go in, start in the morning, anybody change their mind? Nope, adjourn. So they put a shroud over the clock, essentially to stop the passage of time. You know, so they sat there for 104 days, deadlocked, 50-50. And so finally they worked out a deal. I mean, people were getting madder and madder by the day. So the deal was they went ahead and they passed a 40% income tax surcharge. And then uh, on the ballot, they put the question on the ballot, is uh, to maintain the, or to substitute a 2% sales tax and a 10% surcharge for the 40% income tax or surcharge. So the vote came down to, if you voted no, you voted against the sales tax. If you voted yes, or no, if you voted no, you voted against the surcharge. If you voted yes, uh, you voted for the sales tax. Right. And when they counted the vote, it was you know 70 to 30 you know, they don't want a sales tax. Seventy percent no against the sales yeah, tax yeah. and for the income tax yeah. surcharge. So it's very similar to what happened um, 20, 20 some years later with Roscoe yeah. in, in, in 1993 yeah. when it was like, I have a choice between the two. Yeah, they income called this a yeah. legislative, legislatively referred state statute. Hmm. It's essentially an either or, but it's got to be carefully worded so you, you get to vote yes or no. You know, so it was no on the sales tax, yes on the income tax surcharge. One of the advantages that the, uh, the disadvantages I think that the Republicans had in that election was the sales tax was permanent and the surcharge uh, was temporary. temporary. And in fact, when Tom Judge was governor, we got rid of it one time, well, yeah. one time for a while. And uh, you know, this is Montana. I think there's something in the culture here. You know, what we're all about is, you know, it's a hunting and fishing, high school football, and those sales tax. And I mean, that was still <laughs> around in those. Yeah. That, that, it started then, and it's still there. I mean, that's how people think. So, Newell, do you think that um, when your father was you know, watching this happen, do you think that he was thinking, let's, just get, let's get this on the ballot and kill it for good, because I know it's not popular, or was it just uh, letting the legislature do what they wanted to do? I think he felt politically it was the best solution because it, it brought the public participation, the legislative branch into the, into the game. So it wasn't just by administrative fiat, it was by legislative action and a public vote. And I think he felt fairly comfortable that the sales tax was that unpopular that, it, that his side would win. It turned out he was right. Uh, yeah. let, let's move on to um, um, probably Mr. Anderson's first big accomplishment, and that is reorganization of the state government. And be, when he became governor, um, as, as you know, Montana's state government had 170 separate boards and commissions. They didn't have all the department, they didn't have the departments under the governor that they had now. And Bob, now this, when he decided to do this, it actually went to an initiative. I'm just wondering, why did he, de why did he decide to go to an initiative to try to accomplish that, this reorganization? Well, he, first off, he uh, created a committee on reorganization, uh, and it went through as a referendum, referendum. right? Mm -hmm. uh, referendum, and, referendum, and they, they, uh, 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 Duke Crowley 
and uh, George Bogleman and Evan Barrett mm -hmm. helped put together, spent about a year putting to a document together and uh, it was voted on and it was passed and then uh, in the fall they had a chance to create a, uh, as I understand it, about a three foot tall uh, material to give to the legislature and at that point that's when uh, Forrest Anderson uh, put in uh, the uh, uh, Board of Investments. Mm -hmm. And now on a reorganization, um, Alec, you worked for the governor when he was doing this. Why did he feel that was such an important thing to do? I mean, it sounds like a really boring thing, but it was a monumental change in the government, Well, correct? I'll give you the real reason. Okay. Uh, you know, before reorganization, a lot of the departments were run by independent boards and commissions. And uh, if some guy screwed up, you couldn't touch him. You know, if uh, the Liquor Control Board or something was doing things that weren't in the public interest, the governor couldn't get rid of those. Only guys. the board could. Yeah. yeah. And so he said, you know, we talk a lot and we run ads and we're talk, we talk a lot about good government and 20's plenty and all of this stuff. He says, but I'll tell you what this is really about. He says, it's not for me, but it's for the next guy, the next governor of Montana. If uh, there's a rat in the outfit, he'll be able to get rid of him. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And yeah. that's true. And then it, all of a sudden, it became a hell of a lot more responsive. When those agency directors had to pay attention to the governor, then they had to start paying attention to the people. And the government, by that reason, got a lot more responsive. Plus, the organization itself was way better than it had been previously. I mean, nobody knew what the hell was going on up there. And so, so Newell, I'm, I'm just curious as to I look at your, gov your, your, your father's career and a lot of the things he did. I mean, these are big ideas um, as attorney general and especially as governor. And I'm just wondering, what do you think about him made him that way to think that, you know, I'm not just going to do little things around the edges. I'm going to go for the big strikes. Well, I think he was a, a person who had um, political capital from a win from a, a, an election, and he wanted to use that capital appropriately, but he only had so much. He could only get so much done, and he had three ideas, three principal ideas of what he wanted to do while he's, he was in his first term, and he got them done. And I think he didn't overextend himself. He was practical enough to know those were heavy issues, heavy lifting, and it would take four years of hard work to get them done. And he got them done. He didn't, he focused rather than shotgun a lot of that stuff. Mm. Now, Bob, you mentioned the Board of Investments and we're talking about the reorganization. Now, of course, the reorganization, that passed um, by referendum initially, and then they had to create the bill to actually implement it, correct? Is it, and then, yeah. And then the Board of Investments was within that bill. Am I well, correct? And, that, and it's also in worked? the new constitution. Pardon me? And the, the same language is in the new constitution, too. For, for the Board of Investments. And tell us why um, creating the Board of Investments was such a, a, a big deal. Well, the uh, I think we talked about it uh, earlier that uh, there was about $30 million that uh, was in the state assets and after the Board of Investments, after right now it's $18 billion. So right there it sums up what that meant to get it out of the banks into a high yield investment program, a unified program. Yeah. Now, Alec, you were going to say something about that. Up until that time, the state was not... Or the banks were not required to pay interest on state accounts. So all of the money in their treasury was just sitting there idle. And they were making money off it. Oh, damn right they were making money <laughs> yeah. off it. You know, that's, yeah. not, that's why they're on the corner of Park and Main in every city in Montana. But uh, it just made a hell of a lot of sense. You know, there's a great story. So after all of this was done, some guy called some bank and says, Somebody from the state was in there demanding interest. We don't have to pay interest. And I, I says, you need to talk to the governor, sir. So I first took the call. He says, did you vote for the Constitution? The guy says, yes, I did. I think it's about time. He says, did you read it? Damn right, I read it. He said, well, if you read better, you'd know that the Board of Investments is in the Constitution. 
and I remembered it all the way to today. Article <laughs> 8, Section 13, and he read it to the guy. And <laughs> I won't tell you what the guy said, but yeah. it wasn't yeah. kind. Uh, Duel, you, you were going to really, say something about the a really short business. story that's mm -hmm. true. Sometime within the first month of father being governor, he came home one day and he says, you won't believe I got a call from a department director today. And the guy said he pulled the top drawer out of his desk and he said there was a cigar box and it was full of money. And, he, and that's, to some degree, that's how the, the government was run, mm -hmm. is out of cigar boxes and cash in the drawer. It, it mechanically, the, the government was a very inefficient and very poorly run, uh, big organization, big bureaucracy, and that needed to be pulled together. This is one of the big parts that did that. Yeah, and as you mentioned before, the Board of Investments, um, since it was created, has earned the state citizens, the public treasury, about $2 billion in change, which uh, quite a lot of money. And Bob, you mentioned that, that the language for that, my understanding is the language for, to create the Board of Investments was actually kind of snuck into the, the, the bigger bill that created reorganization, and this is one of the things that when we talk about Forrest Anderson, he's called the Silver Fox, or the Fox. Is this, this, I, uh, I attended a meeting that uh, yeah. Joe Reber, uh, you probably attended in the yeah. governor's any office. I was uh, supposed to watch you. <laughs> and and he, he really labeled it down. He said, uh, he told exactly how this canny governor did that. And, and uh, I think the uh, Bankers Association was a vacationing that week because it, they overlooked it and all at once it was in the legislature and they were acting on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, they had a bill the session before that they killed the Bankers Association. By, you know, it was a tough fight up there and I wasn't there but I'd, I'd heard about it. I used to travel around a little bit with them. I heard a lot of stuff. Probably like you, you know. But, uh, you know, it's easy to change. It's not easy but it's normal to change the laws and maybe to change the Constitution. But what he did is he changed the whole culture of the state government. And that's even more important. I mean, people had to start paying attention. Yeah. And that's, that's critical. You mentioned the Constitution, the 72 Constitution, the New State Constitution. And uh, uh, Bob, my recollection, you can, uh, that there was a bill led by, uh, I believe, State Senator Jack McDonald had the bill um, to let the Constitutional Convention meet and then they created it, and then Anderson supported it during the referendum. Just how, how, well, how did he know, get that, behind that's it? A, that's a good question uh, as far as Anderson did support it, but yes. he did not show that he was supporting it. Because uh -huh. I remember when I went to uh, Anderson to say, is it okay, I've been invited to handle the advertising for the new <coughs> constitution uh, by the delegates, and uh, is it okay, uh, we, I, because I don't know how, how you stand on that. He said, Bob, he said, uh, I'm for it, solidly before it. I, we really need it. Don't tell anybody because if they knew I was for it, they would be against it. Huh, and now, now why did he feel that way? I mean, he's the governor, he's a fairly popular guy. He didn't want people to know he was supporting the Constitution, the new change? It's kind of a an effort to depoliticize that constitutional convention. You know, it was a partisan election. And the interesting thing about that is the delegates were elected at the same election that the sales tax was on the ballot. Hmm, yeah. so, so the sales 71. tax got beat by 70 to 30, and they elected 59 Democrats to the Constitutional Convention, which kind of gives you the progressive impetus that was evident in that document. But uh, no, I mean, we were told to stay away from there. And uh, the election was really close and it only carried by 2,500 and some votes. And uh, the people that didn't want it uh, thought, well, we got a way to stop this. And the law says that the question has to be approved by a majority of those voting in the election. Well, in that election, Mike Mansfield was on the ballot. And in addition to the Constitution, there were not numerous other referendums, most prominently legalized gambling. Hmm. And as you might imagine, in Butte, more people voted on the legalized gambling question than voted on the Constitution. So the Constitution did not carry by a majority of all those voting. It carried on a majority of those voting on the question. And the Supreme Court had to settle that. And it went to a three to two margin, and they 
voted to support the Constitution. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, huh. yeah. that's interesting. Let's show our last clip here. This is a clip from, uh, from some campaign material where Mr. Anderson talks about himself and his family. Forrest has been a dedicated family man since he met and married the former Evelyn Sampson of Helena in 1941. She has taken an active part in her husband's career of public service. Their eldest daughter, Margaret, is a University of Montana graduate who is married, the mother of three children. Arlie, their second daughter, is a graduate of Montana State University. She is a high school art instructor. The Andersons' only son, Newell, is a student at Northern Montana College at Haver. Anderson has been at home among Montana's lakes and mountains. At 17, he was hunting grizzly bear in the Bob Marshall Wilderness area near Glacier National Park. Anderson was born in Helena on January 30, 1913, the son of Mr. and Mrs. Oscar Anderson. His Swedish father was a pioneer Helena merchant. His mother was Nora O'Keefe, who migrated here from County Cork, Ireland. We see this sometimes in modern politics, you know, politicians talking about their family, uh, but not always. I'm just wondering, was that unusual then? Um, and, and why was it important for, for your father to do that? Well, I think his family was important to him when he was a child, and I think he carried that forward to, to us. Um, I, I, my dad was a, a firm and steady uh, father. Uh, some people thought he was kind of gruff and mean, but he really wasn't gruff and mean. He was just firm and steady. There was a difference. Uh, but we, we, he was always participatory. We, we did so many things. There were so many quality family times, and he always made for quality family times. A lot of, a lot of politicians get wrapped up in the rubber chicken circuit, and he always kept weekends for his family for doing anything from fishing to hunting to placer gold mining to whatever it was that was on the, on the docket. So he was a family man. He, it was very important to him for, to, to be with his family and to, to live his family together. Now, of course, he didn't run for re-election in 1972 because of some health problems. What, what, what happened there? Why did he say, can't do it? Well, I, think, I don't think many people realized how sick he really was. Physically, Forrest was pretty debilitated. Mm -hmm. After his surgery, he had a hiatal hernia surgery, and it, it just it pretty massively debilitated him. His mind was still active, but his body wasn't. And, and I also think, uh, he told me one time, he said, you know, I got as much done in the first term that I really wanted to get done. I don't really need a second term. So I don't think he left with any regrets for not being able to rerun. Hmm. We've got about a minute left here. Let's, let's talk about 25 seconds each for Bob and for Alec. Talk about the legacy of Horace Anderson. What should we think about when we, when we say that term? Well, I think the legacy of Horace Anderson is if you're smart and you know how the system works and you've got some objectives, you can make change happen. Government can work and he proved that. And he's the only one really in my mind that has proved it conclusively. The things that happened in those four years are probably constitute the largest advance in the history of Montana in government relationship to the people and efficiency in the entire history of the state. You go to subsequent governors, what are they what are they famous for? What have they done? What is out there that would be part of their legacy? You look at Forrest Anderson, what are we talking about? Four things today? That's a damn good That's legacy. Right. Bob, I think we're probably spot out of time here, but so uh, but I uh, echo what he. <laughs> okay, I, I thought he did it very well. Yeah, yes, yeah, I would good. agree. Yeah. And uh, I want to thank my guests, Alec Hansen, Bob Henkel, Newell Anderson, for talking about Governor Forrest Anderson, who was a really amazing governor, 50 years ago elected this year. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Face of State today. I'll be back in two weeks with a preview of the legislature. You've been watching Face to State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.